Um, I hope you've been enjoying uh, the, the series that we've been doing, uh, uh, um, and this morning we're continuing on in that, and I want to uh, read the scriptures together with you, uh, and, and let's prepare our hearts, uh, open the Word of God, and, and, uh, and, and, and read, to, read through this together. I encourage you to follow along. We'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, through to chapter 13, verse 8. So follow along. And then we'll pray before Andy brings the word to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I might boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these beautiful words that teach us about love, teach us about you, teach us about who you've made us to be. We pray right now for Andy as he comes and unpacks this Uh, scripture to us that you would speak through him to our hearts and change us to be like you in Jesus name amen amen thanks Dan so church as we um yeah just when we're praying this morning before the service I just had that sense in my heart of um remember when Jesus said come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest Take my yoke upon you, for it is easy, and my burden is light. Come to me, for I'm lowly, humble and lowly of heart. Um, so even as we get started, I just, I just have a sense that let's just take a moment to do that right now. Like you, you've got, each of us have stuff on our minds and our hearts that have been weighing on us in this past week. Um, maybe things in family or, or home or uh, in work or maybe difficult situations with people that we're facing and things that are weighing on our mind about the future. Let's just take a moment to come to Him. Just bring that. You don't need to park it at the door before you come to church and then put a smile on your face. Sometimes we feel pressure to do that, don't we? Man, the, the kingdom of God is, is not like that. The kingdom of God is we come to Jesus as we are. Praise God. And we can bring to Him the heaviness in our heart. Praise God. And He doesn't say, oh, that's great that you've got that. Keep carrying it. He says, come to me. Let me bear that with you. How awesome is our God, hey? So, so let's just take a moment to do that in stillness. Just bring to him the stuff that's weighing on your heart and just release that and say, Lord, I just want to pass it to you. Thank you that you carry it for me. Jesus, thank you for your beautiful invitation that right now in our hearts, even as we're just passing you these things, the temptation is to take it back and 
put on our shoulders and, and go our merry way. But thank you that you love us. Your word says, cast our cares upon you, Lord, because you care for us. You love us, Lord. So would you lift up the heaviness on all of our hearts, the things that are weighing on our mind, we just release to you. And we trust you, God, that you will keep leading us in the way we should go and that you will provide for us all that we need as we continue to seek you and your kingdom and open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, church, just a reminder, this picture that you're seeing here, it's what God wants to do in us. This luscious, huge, mango-sized grapes of the fruit of the Spirit in your life and in my life. That's what this season is about. That's the transformation that we're focusing on this year, being Spirit-led and right now inviting the Holy Spirit to grow this beautiful fruit in our lives. And um, the church has been through a season, uh, started a season of fasting. So how's the fasting been going, hey? Yeah, so who's already started to feel, wow, I think I feel God just doing something fresh in my life. Yeah, give me a wave if that's you. It's okay, you don't have to. Yeah, all right, so there's a few people that have been feeling that. Who, who's it been hard for, the fast? I, I, just be honest, I've been finding it hard. <laughs> this Daniel fast this last past week. Um, and I was chatting with a few people about it, and it's so funny. As we're praying, as we're entering the fast, we're, we're praying for the fruit of the Spirit. What's happening? Man, more argy-bargy at home. You know, like, hang on, but we're praying for more of the fruit of the Spirit. And, and just sensing, actually, there's stuff is coming up and it's getting hard and, and, and that's part of the weeding process. Weeding's not easy, right? Not that I do a lot of it, confession. Weeding's not easy. But as we actually carve out space and say, God, we're fasting because we want to open up space, humble ourselves before you and invite you to, to just grow in us what you want to grow, we're going to face opposition. And so if that's happening for you, you're not alone. That's all part of the way that Jesus transforms us. It, surgery is not easy. It's not pleasant to get your teeth pulled out, right? But this is, this is how transformation works in us. I um, just want to encourage you with that. And some cool things that have been happening as well. Like, you know how I've been saying that people are getting healed of various things? I've got another testimony this, um, a couple weeks ago. Someone got healed sharing communion online. How good is that? C can we just give God a clap of praise for that? How good is that, right? <laughs> they just at home watching this service, no one's asking for healing, no one's praying for healing, we're just sharing communion, and they got healed. They were so excited, so they sent us that message, we rejoice with them. Anyway, continue on with this. It's so important for us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in the growing of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The reason why is because it's very easy for us to actually get excited about spiritual things, in an unhealthy way. Anyone ever seen people get excited about Holy Spirit, spiritual things in unhealthy ways before? It happens. And actually, that was what was happening in the church in Corinth. So, God was turning up. It was significant. Spirit of God was moving in amazing ways in that Christian community. The Holy Spirit was pouring out gifts on people and the manifestations of the Spirit were popping up and people were getting really excited. People were speaking in, in new languages that the Holy Spirit was giving to them and it was awesome how God was doing that. And um, as, as the Spirit was moving, the congregation were getting excited. I was prepared today, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Praise God. So as, as the Spirit of God was moving, um, people wanted to find out more. They were hungry for more of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, things started getting really messy. People started going, oh, well, what spiritual gift do you have, Mel? All right, you don't have my spiritual gift? Mate, you should see my spiritual gift. You know, oh, Arena, you and me, mate, we got that gift of tongues. Let's just go for it. And so people started to form these little kind of classes, right? There was these divisions amongst the people. Some people started getting arrogant and proud about their spiritual gifts compared to others and started trying to, you know, <laughs> just imagine we were worshipping and singing just now, right? 
It's like someone who's an operatic singer just going extra loud so everyone can hear how amazing their harmonies are. It was a bit like that in the Corinthian church. People were trumpeting their experience of the Holy Spirit. And as they were showing off and thinking that they were better than other people, oh, it, was, it was breaking God's heart, it was breaking Paul's heart. It was so bad. I think there's a lot of mess in the Corinthian church. So bad that even when they had communion feasts together, the rich people would meet extra early to have their communion, finish all the food, and then when some of the poorer people in the community came, there was no communion feast left. It was bad what was happening there. So Paul was really upset. He was saying, guys, this is not the way of Jesus. This is not how his kingdom works. Let me share with you, says says Paul, you know, the Spirit, get excited about the Spirit, go for it, pursue it, but let me show you there's a better way, there's a more excellent way to live your life. And another way to phrase this when you translate it is, this is the way that is beyond comparison, to live your life as a believer of Jesus in community. And what is that way that is beyond comparison? Someone tell me. Love. Thanks, Sam. He just mouthed it, and that felt extra special. The way of love. That is the way that is beyond comparison. That is the most excellent way to live our life. The way that needs to drive almost the way that we, that, that we live, and everything else kind of jumps on that bandwagon. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit as expressed through love. And I remember we actually uh, have some friends that are missionaries in Turkey. And um, he was sharing with me that one day, AJ and Karen, that's their names, one day they were having uh, just a friend over who was not a believer, just a um, Muslim Turkish uh, neighbor. And as they started having some tea together, the topic got onto love. And The Bible was right there on the table. AJ pulled it out, opened it to the same passage that Sam read just now, and the man just said, what is this? This is beautiful. And he was getting emotional. This is beautiful. I've never heard anything in my life. And, you know, some of us were like, oh, man, I've heard that a thousand times. I've been to weddings, you know, all over the shop. Everyone chooses this passage, you know. Uh, It's a beautiful passage. And, And so it loses its impact on us. I pray that today we would have fresh eyes to see the beauty of what's in this passage, of the most excellent way to live our life. And we're going to be looking at, firstly, the value of this love, and then we're going to be looking at what this love actually looks like. You ready, guys? Awesome. So before Paul actually goes into what this love actually looks like, he wants to make sure that the Corinthian church really understand how important it is, how essential it is. Because what happened was the Corinthians especially, uh, were especially excited about the gift of tongues. So for those of you maybe who aren't aware, the gift of tongues is one of the gifts the Holy Spirit gives where we are given the new ability to speak in a different language. You, generally speaking, it, it's not understandable unless there's an interpretation gift with it. Um, and that enables uh, a different type of encounter with our prayer life with God. So that's what tongues is. So the Corinthians, they were really excited about that. And Paul said, look, you know what? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, in the pagan worship that was in that region during that time, they actually used gongs and cymbals as part of their worship. And it was monotone. Literally, it was just gong, 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 gong. And, and that was it. It was just a drone, right? And that droning sound was part of their worship to false idols. And so Paul is saying, let's catch this. Paul is saying, even if I speak in all these tongues, if I don't have love, it's just like pagan worship. Oh my gosh, you serious, Paul? Dong, dong, 
Gong, that's what it's like without love. It's empty. Perhaps even worse than empty. Now, Paul goes on. He's on a bit of a roll. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, can understand all mysteries and knowledge. In in other words, even if I catch everything, you come to me, say, Paul, tell me about the Trinity, bang, you know. Help me understand life after death, bang. Just everything, just absolutely has it all. If, If I can move mountains with my faith, But if I do not have love, what does it say? I am nothing. You what? (laughs) But but these gifts are good, right? Yeah, they're they're good, they're good. He's not saying these gifts are bad, by the way. They're good. But what he's trying to say is without love, I'm nothing. Even if I can do all these things, Without love, I'm nothing. Sometimes we find our self-worth in the things that we're able to do, don't we? From a young age, well done, Andy. Mum mom was so proud I could blow my nose on my own. <laughs> and praise God, because I need to blow my nose a lot. Well done. We grow up with that sense of, I can do this, I can accomplish that. Paul's saying, no, the sense of true value and true sense of worth is in love. Isn't that amazing, hey? He keeps going. He's on a roll. He said, even if I gave everything away to the poor, sacrificed my body to Jesus, without love I gain nothing. So all these gifts, uh, this knowledge, the tongues, the sacrifices, the only really mean something when they are saturated in love. Otherwise, they mean nothing, I am nothing, I gain nothing. And it makes me think a little bit of gold. You know, sometimes you add a bit of gold to something and all of a sudden that thing is really valuable, right? Like I was was thinking about, you know, gold leaf and that gold leaf and they eat it. Like, are you serious? I don't understand it, right? So so it's a bit like that. You you, you put that thing in there, it becomes valuable. You remove that thing, it, it can become meaningless. I mean, who wants to eat a leaf? Oh, it's salad. All right, okay. All right. So, so in a similar kind of way, with love, when love is there, all of a sudden, that true value of whatever that thing is just multiplies. That's how I'm seeing this in terms of the gifts. But when it's taken away, nothing there. All right, so that's the value of love, absolutely essential. And I think what Paul is really trying to get at is we can't do the Christian life without love. No way. So let's have a look at what this love is, what this love looks like. So when we break it down, it's what it is, what it does not do, and what love actually does. So um, as we look at this, you're going to notice a few things. That all these descriptions about love, they're all verbs. And what are verbs? They're action words. <laughs> they're doing words. Okay, so when we're looking through this, it's not going to be an airy fairy. Love is the mysterious. No, no, no. It's it's going to be very practical. Now, the other thing I want to just point out here is, as we go through this, we might start feeling conviction. I know I did, mate. First verse. Oh God, I'm convicted. But that's not a bad thing. If it moves us to a dependency on God to grow this love in your life and in my life. Yep. So if you feel the conviction, sometimes we feel the conviction and we just crawl into a cave of kind of, you know, just just uh, self-deprecation and, oh, Andy, you're so unloving. You know, God doesn't want us to stay in that cave. He wants us to feel the conviction, but then lean upon Him and ask Him to transform us so that this love would grow, to cooperate with Him so that this love would grow in our life. So if you feel the conviction... Even right now, as we're going through this, just call out to God and ask Him to grow that love in us. Okay, so you ready? All right, so this is what love is. The first two verbs, very beautiful. Love is patient and love is kind. And actually, it's a beautiful representation of the heart of God and His character. Because if you look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says that His his love is, is kind of, it's, it's patient, it's long-suffering, it's enduring. And I think that 
word long suffering is really helpful. You know, some of us, we know what that long, long suffering is, right? It, it means that the other person, oh man, it's so hard. They, they just, it's hard to love them, right? They do something, they say something, they hurt us or whatever it is, but you know what? We keep on loving them. That's what that love is patient is, long-suffering, the ability to keep enduring, even though it, it's hard for us or it hurts us. Love is kind, meaning that it's graciously generous to the other person. And it talks about how the kindness of God is, is there to, to move us towards repentance. And so even the first two verbs, I'm like, God, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm convicted already. I need your help. Because there are some people in my life I find really hard to be patient with. There are others who, very gladly, I see them, mate, you know, oh, sorry, I'm three hours late. Don't worry. Give us a hug. It's so good to see you. Other people, you know, like two minutes late, oh, far out. Jeez. So many things I've got to do. Busy day. Didn't even message. Am I the only one that has people that are hard to be patient with in my life? Yeah? Okay, good. It's just me. <laughs> so I'm thinking, Paul, stop it, right? It's hard enough already. You know, but praise God that the love that we are to love with, praise God that it's the divine love that he fills our heart with. Amen? Romans 5.5. 5. He has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So then next, Paul goes on to describe what love does not do. And I realized as I was uh, preparing this sermon that there's actually more descriptions of what love does not do than what it does. Isn't that curious? <laughs> so, and the reason why that's helpful is because you think about anything, right? Riding a bike, cooking, you know, when you're learning stuff, it's as much about what it is and also what to avoid. Andy, don't put the water in the oil, right? You know, psh, right? You know, no, 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 when you cycle, do this, you gotta get the balance right, don't do that. And so as we're looking at the what do not do, it'll give us a great revelation about what this divine love that God wants to grow us looks, actually looks like. So this is the first one, it says, first one is do not, love does not envy. And so envy is that really strong feeling of jealousy, towards another person. It's almost like you're being competitive with them. Maybe you see what they can do or you see what they have and, and you, just, you just really want that. And you know, there was a competitive spirit in the Corinthian church. It was almost like people were trying to, you know, get a leg up on the other person and, and to just be better than the other person. So love doesn't do that. Love avoids envy. Now, the next one is love does not boast. And there's some people that love to brag and that love to bring attention to themselves, you know, elevating themselves about, above others. And, you know, the funny thing is that that could be about anything. You know, oh, you know, I, I hit my personal best on this or, you know, like, oh, my, my, my food was so good, you know, like, and, and it's not bad to, to thank God for the things that we're good at, but some people love to brag and boast. Um, and, and it could be about any, it could even be about, you know, health, about children, about wealth. Sometimes people do the humble brag. Has anyone heard about the humble brag before? No? Okay. So the humble brag is where you complain about something as a way of boasting about something. For example, oh, it's so cold in my very big house. <laughs> or another example might be, oh, you know, I'm getting so many messages on my phone and emails, it's just annoying because everyone wants my Luxa recipe. So that's, that's the humble brag, you know? So, so it's using a f form of complaining, you know, oh, you know, my, my, my kids, they just come home and they just want to do homework for three hours. Why, God? <laughs> and then inside it's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. You heard the phrase, proud as a peacock, right? 
while courting, the male peacock opens up its plumage, sometimes up to five feet tall, and begins to flap <laughs> in front of the female. I'm so glad Melissa's at the front today. <laughs> Trying to get attention, you know, hoping that it's going to happen. Actually, it's really funny when you watch pigeons do that. Like, I, I could sit and watch that for an hour, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> Just eating my Maccas. Uh, anyway, and it's so funny because you look at that male pigeon, you think, it's not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. It just doesn't happen. Anyway, um, we can do that with our lives. We can do that even with our faith. The Corinthian believers were doing that with their faith, with their spiritual gifts. How weird is that? Look how much I'm praying. Look how much I can speak in tongues louder than you. Oh, man. Anyway, love does not boast. And similar kind of thing, it's not proud. Same kind of category here. This literally means puffed up and arrogant. The kind of way of thinking where we, we see that we're superior, we think we're superior than others. And sometimes we might even put other people down in the process. Now, love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. Now, some people... Uh, sometimes humiliate or shame other people. Sometimes they might disgrace other people. Sometimes they do it openly. You know, look how silly you are. Or look how stupid that was. Or look how overweight, or look how this, look how that. You can't do this, you can't do that. Or I can't believe you, you did this. So just the shaming, and sometimes it's not that obvious. Sometimes it's through gossip or slander. Sometimes it's, did you hear that so-and-so did this? And love doesn't do that. And love is not self-seeking. It's not self-centered, not self-serving. Love actually considers others. I think about the dinner table. And uh, sometimes at the dinner table, we can see an expression. You know, if, if someone goes and takes all the good pieces first, you know, I'm going to take the claw, I'm going to take the drumstick or whatever it is, right? You know, and then just get it on my plate first. You know, and it doesn't matter if other people don't have what they need, I just want what I have first. There's a way of living life like that. There's a way of even doing church like that. Come to church, man, do I get what I need first? Do I get my fellowship first or do I get my, am I having what I need first without a consideration of others? But love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. And I love the ESV because it translates it as love is not easily irritable. You know, I'm just going to be honest with you here. One time I was praying for our kids, and I said, God, I pray that you would just bless Nathaniel and Annalise. I pray you would just bless them and that they would have the freedom to be themselves and that they would be confident in their identity as your kids and they could just be themselves. And then as I was praying that prayer, just God brought to my mind all the different ways that I was like, hey, Nathaniel, Eat with your mouth closed. Hey, sit closest to the table. Hey, do this, do that, do that. And I think it was maybe a build-up of doing that a lot, you know, over those, over those weeks in particular. And I felt the conviction. And look, it's not bad to teach your kids to eat with their mouths closed. Come on, it's an important part of life, right? <laughs> but what I realized was I was getting easily irritable, easily irritated by different things. And, and I said, God, I'm sorry. Because here I am asking that you would help my children to be comfortable and confident in who they are in you and just express that. And in my irritation, am I reflecting that that's who you are as the Heavenly Father? Or am I kind of painting a picture that maybe you're a God who nitpicks all the time, getting easily irritated by different things? Oh, I can't believe you did that. Stop bumping into me. And so I brought that before God. I said, I'm sorry. Would you, would you do some work in my life? Because I don't want to be easily irritable. I don't want to be easily angered by small things. 
I, wanna, I want my parenting to paint a picture of who you really are, God. And I don't say that to cause any sort of guilt in anyone here. I'm just sharing out of my own experience. Um, and that was a way that, that I called out to God for help in that. And I still need to keep praying for that. Love keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't hold on to grudges to settle the score. Me and Mel used to watch a, a, a TV show called Revenge. And that show, Revenge, anyone else seen Revenge before? In that show, uh, there was a list of all these people that had hurt her father and somehow done all these things. And so at the end of the episodes, when she got her revenge, she would cross their name off her lists, just one by one, you know. And you could see this, this kind of mm, in her face. Again, love does not keep record of wrongs. And uh, I don't know the hurt that people have caused you in your life. But what I do know is, this is only going to kill you. It's only going to kill me if we live this way. Yeah. The same, the same, that saying about, it's like drinking poison, waiting for the other person to die. Yeah, that, that's not how the kingdom of God works. So I want to encourage us. Love keeps no record of wrongs. It entrusts it to God. It forgives out of the overflow of God's forgiveness for us. And it does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It made me think of when I saw this uh, Australia's Funniest Home Videos. I don't know if anyone used to watch that. I used to watch it and I thought, why are people laughing when people look like they need to go to hospital straight after this video and maybe have six months of corrective surgery? <laughs> um, I think there's something about it that, I don't know, like... Maybe when we see people hurt themselves, I don't know, well, I don't know why it's funny, but, uh, but this concept here of delighting in evil is a little bit further down the path of that. That when someone gets hurt, when someone stumbles, when someone sins, or when someone falls or makes a mistake, then we somehow we're like, ha, ha. Sucked in. That's the phrase that I learned when I was growing up at school. Suck eggs was another one, right? Love does not do that, but it rejoices in the truth. The gospel reflects forgiveness. It reflects kindness, compassion, justice. When we see those things overflowing in people's lives, then love says, yes, awesome. Yeah, that person forgave that other person after this kind of pain over all these years. That's great. Oh, that person was extra gracious. Awesome. That, that's love rejoices in the truth. Okay, so... I look at that list, and I'm telling you already, I was already mega convicted at this stage, calling out, Holy Spirit, I need more of you, right? But guess what? Paul keeps going, <laughs> right? So this is what love does do, okay? We're going to fly through these. So love always protects. And this image here means that it tries to cover people. You know, uh, I don't know, the bodyguard, Kevin Costner, you know, Whitney Houston, I don't know, like just, just someone's getting hurt and the other person is trying to cover them so that they will not get hurt, okay? So that's the image here of it always protects. You know, so, so when we see people, whatever they're going through, it's the opposite of dragging people through the dirt. It, it, it really is just kind of seeking to rescue people in that, in that sense from the shame that they could face. And I know many of us have experienced when people have come to protect us, sometimes in an unexpected way, it's amazing, isn't it? It's like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you for saying that in that meeting or standing up for me. Or thank you for coming alongside me when, you know, when mom or dad or whatever said this or did that. I'm so grateful. Love always protects. Love always trusts. And this concept is giving the benefit of the doubt and seeing the best in other people. You know, there have been fallouts that I've had with people in the past, and when those fallouts have happened, all of a sudden, I interpret all the things that they do. Anyone done that before? And it doesn't matter what they, they flinched. Oh, man, they were, that was aggressive. You know, or maybe they walked past us and they didn't smile. Oh, man, it's because of what happened. It's so, they're so disrespectful. You know, and, and so we start interpreting the things that people are doing through the lens of, our brokenness and our hurt with them. But love doesn't do that. Oh, they flinched. 
must be because it's flinching season. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, something must be going on. Maybe something's going on in their life. Maybe they've had a hard time at home. You know, or maybe it's not what I thought that it meant. The benefit of the doubt. And that's, that always trust is also connected with always trusting in God as well. Uh, assuming the best anchored in trusting in God. It always hopes. Love is confident about the future, no matter what it is that we're going through, because it, it focuses on the promise of God. God, whatever happens, I know that you will triumph. Whatever happens, I know your kingdom will reign. I know that, that, that you will work all things together for the good of those who love you, according to your purpose and plan. And that hope brings joy in our everyday. And lastly, love always perseveres. And so this idea of persevering, it's not meant to be a sit-back persevering. It's, it's meant to be a, you're in the middle of a battle, and you've been knocked down, and maybe you've even been injured, but you get up from the floor, you get back up again, you're not going to give up. You know, even though you're, you're down for the count, by the grace of God and the strength He gives, you get back up on your feet again and you keep going. That's the image of love always perseveres here. It endures. It presses through. So that is what love is. Wow. It's quite a lot, isn't it? What it does not do, uh, what it what, what, it, what it does, what it does not do, ah, I forgot. Anyway, I think you know. <laughs> That's what love is. Now, you've heard this probably many times, but again, I think it's important for us to replace this with the word Jesus. This is the love that God has for you and for me, church. This is the affection that he has towards us and only a snapshot of it. It's even more beautiful than this the way in which Jesus' love and affection overflows for you and for me. He is patient. He is kind. Oh, wow. He does not envy. He does not boast. He does not want to keep a record of wrongs. As soon as we confess to him, bang. As soon as we place our trust in him, it's gone. He has forgotten it. Praise God, according to his word. He never fails. I think this is really important for us because... The last thing that we want anyone to do leaving from church today or from the oncoming weeks is to say, I'm going to make this love happen in my life. I'm, I'm just going to grow it. Come on, Andy. Come on. You know, be more patient. That, that, that. If the source of our love is not the love of God, it's not going to happen. So I'm, I'm urging us to say, thank you, Jesus, that you love me so much. And that this will be the river from which the stream of our love will flow. Does that make sense? We need the ocean of God's love to pour out the river of love in our life. Secondly, on a place the word love with you. This, and you might think, Andy, no way. You don't know what I'm like. You don't know what my family is like. You don't know what my spouse is like. <laughs> you don't know what I'm facing. You don't know, you don't see what I'm like. You know what? When I looked at this, I'm telling you now, I said in my own heart, Jesus, this is impossible if it's in my own strength. No way. But Jesus, with you, I know that this is possible. I know you can grow this love in my life. I know that that can be a description of me, growing in me. And I'm just going to read this out. And I want to just encourage you for a moment, just to close your eyes, but don't fall asleep. This is the picture of the Holy Spirit shaping you. You are patient. You are kind. You do not envy. You do not boast. You are not proud. You do not dishonor others. You are not self-seeking. You are not easily angered. You do not keep a record of wrongs. 
You do not delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. You always protect, always trust, always hope, always persevere. Okay, you can open your eyes now. That is the picture of what the Holy Spirit is doing in you and me. Not meant to be a report card. You go home and mark yourself. Hey, can you mark me? No. But it's meant to be an invitation to walk in the divine love of God. So this is the most excellent way to live life. We need to partner with the Holy Spirit to be able to grow this in us. It's the way that is beyond comparison. And the beautiful thing about this is this love will never fail. The spiritual gifts will go. Prophecy will go. Uh, the gifts of uh, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, tongues, they're going to go. But one thing's going to remain. And you know what that thing's going to remain? It's love. Love was in the fabric before the creation of the world, in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Love is what moved uh, Jesus to be slain before the foundation of the world for, for us. Love is going to endure to the end. In fact, when all things come together, it's going to be the great marriage of the Lamb with which the love of God is going to be center, front and center with the people of God. When you and I sow in love, we are sowing to something that is eternal and beautiful and that will never fail. And this is so beautiful. Now, here's the soul training for this week. I might invite the worship team to, to come and join me now. The soul training for this week, as you know, we're entering into a season, we've entered into a season of fasting. And so this next week, starting tomorrow, which doesn't mean that you should be as negative as you can today, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Right, so starting tomorrow, we're going to do a negativity fast, which is very simple. I want to encourage us to be fasting from negative, critical thoughts and words, gossiping and complaining. So if you somehow work out... Uh, like a kind of a loophole to be negative in another way that is outside of these things, then just add that to your same description of negative stuff you're fasting from, okay? Um, and so fast from those things. When you feel it, catch it. And I'm, I'm going to be just real with you now. Just even this past week, I'm just feeling all these negative thoughts come in, right? And sometimes we don't, we don't stop them when they come in. They come in and... We toss them around a little bit, but sometimes we let them sit on the couch of our mind. You know, we let them kind of just make their home in, in our minds. And God was just, just reminding me, Andy, you've got to get that out. I want to help you. Don't marinate that. Don't, don't let that simmer and cook and just become part of, of the way that you live into today. I want, I want to deal with that. So I've, I've been starting this thing even before negativity because I needed to. So when those things come, catch them with the help of God and replace them. Whatever that thing is, I guarantee you there's something in the Word of God that speaks the opposite of what that thing is that's in your mind and heart. So focus on God and His Word and instead of that negative speech or that criticism or that gossip, speak words of life and words of love as the Spirit empowers you. We can do this, church, with the help of the Spirit. And so as we're doing that, I want to encourage us to keep inviting him. Grow the fruit of love in my life, Holy Spirit. Grow it in my household. You know, oh, grow it in my workplace. They, they might not even know you're doing this, but it doesn't matter. But you can tell them, grow it in your work, grow it in my workplace, God. Just grow it in my life. That sound good, church? Can I get an indication of commitment for the negativity fast? Give me a wave. You're going to give this a crack this week. Oh, thank you. I feel like catching fire. Is that one of those? Yeah. Can't remember what it was. That, 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 that series. Yes. We're doing this together. Now, the worship team are going to sing this song over us very gently. Very gentle, huh? Yeah? Just lightly, yeah? And all of us here, just let the love of Jesus just wash over us. We're going to do this, and then we're going to do something a bit different straight after, but, but let's do that right now. Let's just wait before God. He's here. He's already moving. Let's just soak in His presence. Jesus.
as we think about your love right now, we ask there to be a tangible, manifest overflow of your love right now over all of us. God, let your love wash over every heart and mind. Let it break over the shame. Let it break over the loneliness. Let it break over the brokenness. Thank you, Lord. Receive that love afresh. Receive that affection afresh right now. To this next bit. Have a look at the screen here and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Say, so Holy Spirit, is there an aspect of this love that you especially want to grow in my life? And then as you feel just drawn to a particular part of this description, maybe part of it is confessing to God, God, I'm sorry that I have been impatient or God, I'm sorry that I have been keeping a record of wrongs. Whatever that might be, just bring it to him right now and ask him to do the weeding and feeding, yeah? Just invite him right now to just do that. Hallelujah. We just want to praise you that your love for us is so beautiful. Even these words don't capture the fullness of your affection towards us. So we thank you. And we thank you that your love covers us and washes over us. We thank you that you fill us with your love. And we pray, God, from the ocean of your limitless affection, that you would fill us afresh with a fresh batch of your love. And God, even the things that have come to our mind, God, uh, we just bring them to you and thank you that you are the master gardener. You're the one working. You're the one doing heart surgery in us. You're the one that, that is planting seeds and watering them, Lord God. And we just believe in faith that as we enter into this week, we are going to see your hand at work and we want to cooperate with you. We want to follow your nudge, God, especially as we enter into that negativity fast. Oh God, we need 
you're empowering to be able to do that. So open doors for us, God. Yeah, just work in us, we pray. And even as you've washed your love over us, Lord, let healing flow, God. Whatever healing that is needed, let restoration renewing flow, Lord God, in our lives. Oh, thank you that your forgiveness flows to wash away sin and guilt and shame, Lord God. Praise you for that. Oh, we praise you and we just, yeah, we just want to sing to you right now for your amazing love and grace. Why don't we do that, church? Why don't we stand? We're going to sing this song together and then bring our service to a close. Amazing. Amazing grace. How sweet.